fit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between Aneta and Charlotte, first-year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now, let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Bill, this is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part time work. Now. I just have to complete your details on the computer. Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E? Yes. J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N-E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street student residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's 126. 126. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's 0414847748. I'll just check. No, sorry, not 748. It's 749. 0414847749? Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose, though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day, if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. But I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. OK. Well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation and kitchen work and pizza delivery if you've held a driving licence for 12 months. I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? As you listen to the rest of the conversation, Answer questions 6 to 11. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7pm and I'm supposed to finish at 11pm, but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3am. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9am lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays, but they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick so they couldn't get to the bank, but they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence, but I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? 
Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Um, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3pm. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at 315 you take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now. Four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. So, Enrique, have you started your research project on cities yet? I've done a bit of reading around the topic and made a few notes. But, if I'm honest about it, I really haven't done as much as I'd have liked to because I'm finding it a bit difficult. <laughs> you don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that. I feel the same way. I think the key is to be able to make valid research questions. You're probably right about that. Didn't we have some lectures on how to write research questions? I think it was towards the beginning of the term. Yes, we did. I've got my notes somewhere in this file. I tell you what, why don't we look at the notes together and then try and come up with some research questions? At least that would be a good starting point. Give us some sense of where we're going with this. Brilliant idea. Let's get started. OK. From what I remember, a good research question is all about knowing from the outset what it is you're trying to find out. Yes. And now that I'm looking at my notes again, I see I've written here that it's to do with understanding and Evaluation. So, understanding a particular issue and evaluating any problems around it. And of course, a very important part is not overlooking any research that has already been done. Past research is just as important as what is being done now. It's a bit, I suppose, like looking at the research that's already been done and seeing if it agrees or disagrees with your own ideas. Mm, sure, I hear what you're saying. But to do that properly, you have to have a clear idea in your head what your own research question is. And by that, I mean uh, specific areas you want to focus on. 
Let's face it. There's so much information out there, and we can't possibly include it all in two thousand words. <laughs> Don't remind me. The thought of writing two thousand words at the moment seems like a huge mountain to climb. I know, but let's try to make a start. I think we're meant to be identifying what makes a successful city, and also try to explain why there has been such a steady population movement of people from rural to urban areas. But I'm a bit confused because. I don't think this is meant to be the main focus of our research.、Mm. Perhaps that's why the lecturer said we need to write questions, and that must be our starting point. Okay. Well, what we're investigating is more than simply what elements make a city successful, but we're also trying to offer possible explanations. So we have two questions: Why do people want to move to cities? And why do people choose to live in them? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay then, I think the first issue concerning successful cities must be the economy.、Uh, people move to cities for better job prospects, and successful cities are cities that have thriving economies. That's true enough. It does mean that cities can offer good job opportunities, which seems to me. To suggest that a city will only be successful if it attracts the right kind of people to work there. What kind of person are you talking about? Well, I suppose I'm referring to the skilled labour force. You know, the idea that up-and-coming young people will move to cities, settle there, maybe buy property, and so that city will get the most talented, creative minds. But. If a city doesn't offer this, then obviously it will lose out, as university leavers will choose elsewhere. You could be right there, but I also think that when cities encourage businesses to develop, then you obviously have money pouring into the city, which can raise the general standard of living. So we've definitely got a question worth investigating. But. Apart from the economic factor, I think another point worth mentioning is the environment. Sure, we can research areas like the quality of the air, how clean it is, and then there's traffic. Um, is there too much traffic? How is it controlled? And also the issues of noise pollution and how the city manages its waste. Um, oh, and I nearly forgot. The environment includes green spaces like parks. Those are all valid points, but I think you've overlooked the whole issue of beauty. Beauty? Are you sure? What's beauty got to do with the environment? Well, don't you think if you were deciding whether or not you would live in a city, your first impressions would be made with your eyes? So the buildings in a city are really important. If the entire city looks like a concrete jungle, then it's unlikely to make people want to live there, is it? I think successful cities are those which have managed to strike a balance between old buildings and new ones. So, of course, you'd have some buildings reflecting more modern architecture, but others that haven't lost their character and still represent the past. You're right, actually. I've often thought that buildings tell a story. I mean, you can tell the history of a place by looking at the buildings. I know exactly what you mean, and let's not forget that the environment includes cultural aspects. So, for example, what's the cultural life like? For me, 
a successful city will be attractive because it will have lots to offer, like a good nightlife and a wide variety of places to visit in the day, like museums and galleries, places like that. True, true. My own view is that some cities have an energy about them that exciting to be in, and other cities are the opposite. <laughs> Well, we've covered so much ground here, but I think there's one final aspect we should research. What's that then? The social aspect, because let's face it, cities are made up of people. They are, and surely a successful city would be one where there is a sense of community, a place where people would feel safe and want to raise families in. <laughs> This topic is limitless. <laughs> That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Good morning. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. Firstly, it is clear that tiredness is on the rise. No official data exists on the rate of people reporting to doctors with recurring tiredness. But it's a very common complaint. Research suggests that people are not relaxing properly, and often work when they do not have enough energy. Furthermore, products to boost energy are also on the rise. Sales of so-called energy drinks loaded with caffeine and sugar have grown by 23 percent over the last year. And this is not the only instance of an increase in products claiming to boost energy. Guarana, a herbal stimulant, can now be found in everything from chocolate bars. To tea bags. Now let's examine what it is that's making people so tired. Dr. Liebhold, a Sydney GP, has done extensive research into this, and he believes that financial pressures, not taking holidays, and not having time off when you become ill due to fear of losing your job, are all common causes. Some of the other suggested causes are low oxygen levels in offices, poor diet, or illness. The problem is that tiredness is a symptom of just about every kind of illness, which makes tracking down the cause all the more difficult. The next question to ask is: Are people getting enough sleep? Dr. Mansfield from Melbourne's Epworth Sleep Centre, who specialises in sleep disorders, says insomnia often arises when people are going through a stressful period. Mansfield often needs to re-educate people in how to get off to sleep. He recommends keeping your body clock regular by going to bed and rising at similar times every day, and not drinking too much caffeine. And there is some truth in the old story about having a glass of hot milk before bed. Milk contains the amino acid tryptophan, which has been shown to help induce sleepiness. Turning to the question of why we need sleep, researchers are still trying to answer this fundamental question. Sleep deprivation experiments have shown that after 14 days without sleep, rats will lie down and die. 
and after only three days' sleep loss, humans get confused, forgetful, and start having hallucinations. So whatever sleep does, it is important. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. However, not all researchers feel the same way. Trent Watson of the Dietitians Association is not convinced by McMahon's theory, explaining that our bodies don't really like to burn protein as a fuel, so it doesn't really contribute to energy levels. Carbohydrates, however, found in fruit, breads and pastas, are a more common fuel. Anyone following a rigidly high-protein diet with low carbohydrates, even if they are operating at low intensity during the day, could subject themselves to fatigue because they just don't have the carbohydrate stores, Watson says. In general, a good way to stay energised from a dietary point of view is to eat red meat, green leafy vegetables and whole grains. These foods give red blood cells the building blocks for optimum performance in their role of delivering oxygen to muscles. To sum up, tiredness is a health problem on the increase and there continues to be much debate surrounding its causes and remedies. Now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on coral reef. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Do you fancy diving in the wonderful world of coral reefs, green sponges, colourful fish and red crabs? It is a rich garden beneath the waves. But how much do you know about the corals? Are they animals or plants? What are the threats to coral reefs? Today, Mr Tim Harford, Executive Director of the Coral Reef Alliance, is going to introduce the facts about coral reefs. Good afternoon, everyone. Coral reefs are one of nature's most magnificent creations. It is filled with thousands of unique and valuable plants and animals. Over one quarter of all marine species depend on healthy coral reefs. Humans also depend on coral reefs. These marine ecosystems are the primary source of food and income for millions of people a vast repository of valuable chemical compounds and medicines, and a natural wave barrier that protect beaches and coastlines from waves and storms. Coral is actually the exoskeletons of coral polyps. Made from limestone, these skeletons build up over time, forming the reef. New corals are born each April. At a certain hour, on a certain night, Mature corals suddenly release clouds of eggs and sperm into the sea. After the fertilised eggs take root on the seafloor, they can grow up to 15 centimetres per year. Coral reefs are present in the waters of over 100 countries. These are warm, 18 to 29 degrees centigrade, 
shallow, sunny regions primarily between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Only clear, warm salt water can support a coral reef. And because sunlight is crucial to the reef's survival, the water must also be shallow. The algae that grow on coral provide much of the coral's food. In deeper water, algae cannot get the sunlight they need to grow. Most coral reefs are in the tropics because natural conditions there are perfect. In their modern form, coral reefs have thrived on Earth for over 50 million years. In recent years, however, more than 11% of the world's reefs have been lost, with another 16% severely damaged during the El Nino event in 1998. Up to 32% of coral reefs may be destroyed by human activities in the next 30 years if we do not take action now. Corals and coral reefs are extremely sensitive. Slight changes in the reef environment may have detrimental effects on the health of entire coral colonies. These changes may be due to a variety of factors. One of the greatest threats to coral reefs is human expansion or development. As human population increases, so does the harvest of resources from the sea. Due to overfishing, reef fish populations have been greatly decreased in some areas of the world. The removal of large numbers of reef fish has caused the coral reef ecosystems to become unbalanced. As we know, corals are also very popular as decorations. A large amount of the most healthy corals are selected by commercial collectors. They sell the corals to souvenir shops, where a large number of tourists wait to purchase them as decorations or souvenirs. Coral reefs also receive much damage from both commercial and private vessels. The leakage of fuels into the water and the occurrence of spills by large tankers are extremely damaging to local corals. Although much of the coral reef's degradation is directly blamed on human impact, there are several natural disturbances which cause significant damage to coral reefs. The most recognized of these events are hurricanes or typhoons, which bring powerful waves to the tropics. These storm waves cause large corals to break apart and scatter fragments about the reefs. Home to a diverse community of creatures, coral reefs are underwater treasure chests of color and activity. Predators and prey swim and crawl among the coral in nature's never-ending dance of life and death. This lively, fascinating world beneath the waves is just waiting to be explored. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the 